Oh, it fits in the garage. Yeah. All right. Thank you all for being here. I'm so glad that you've uh, that you've come. A lot of things going on today. Lots of moving parts. So the schedule is all a little topsy turvy. But um, believe me, I I mean this when I say it. Those of you that make the effort to want to come for Sunday school because you have hunger for the Word of God. I bless that in you in the name of Jesus Christ and may he just prosper and bring good fruit from that that your your desire to know more of God's word brings uh, tremendous blessings in your in your life so we're on the uh, page today that says um, heaven and eternity and I think last week the only one we did was Roman numeral one letter a. That's, that's, the, that's as far as we got. Um, there is a heaven to anticipate. So the thrust of, of what we're doing today, and probably I'm sure, maybe maybe two two more weeks to get through this page, depending on how slowly we go. But um, the thrust of this, with relation to our suffering, is that our suffering as Christians should always be in light of an eternal perspective. And that there is there is a heaven uh, that we look forward to, and our sufferings on earth should be seen in light of that. And there is also a hell and an eternal torment, and sufferings should be seen in light of that as uh, as well. Um, so, I, I was at a conference not that long ago, and one of the speakers was talking about the the blessings of difficulty, how bad things that happen in our lives, God uses them in wonderful ways. And he was a good speaker, smarter than I am, I'm sure. Uh, but he said, I think he said it twice, and, and I just cringed when I heard it, that we tell our people too easily to think about heaven. And he said it as if that's kind of like a, a cliched answer that we should avoid. And I'm like, no. That's, we should remind you of that again and again and again. And guess what? It's in, and this was funny. Did I say this last week? That same day that he said that, at the closing devotions, we had a hymn. And the last verse of the hymn was talking all about, how, you know, in light of our suffering, help us to remember heaven, Lord. Um, I see it in the scripture all over the place. It's in our liturgy. It's in the scripture. It's all over. That we, when we, when we go through things... We are thinking about the eternal perspective. We, we, we Christians do not look like this. We see this. Right? So let's pick up at uh, Roman numeral 1, letter A, uh, number 1. So pain, suffering, and death, what's going to happen to all of those someday? They will all cease. They will all cease. Let's just see that in a few of the scriptures here that we have. Let's look at Revelation 21. Revelation, the Revelation to St. John, chapter 21. This is a, one of the a great funeral texts. We often read this one at funerals. Would somebody read verses 1? Through four. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with me. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. All right, how much more clear can it get than that? The death, crying, pain, all those things will be will be gone. These guys selling the... Uh, the hemp fauna and stuff, they're all going to be out of business. There's, they got nothing to do up in heaven, that's for sure. Um, so a new heaven and a new earth. 
So Peter tells us, right, the old heavens and the earth will all be destroyed with fire. So everything that exists now that is tainted with the brokenness of sin or related to it in any way, it's, it's like a fresh, brand new beginning with all of that stuff gone. And uh, the, the first earth will have passed away and the sea will be no more. Isn't that interesting? The, um, the Hebrews were not a seafaring people. So when you read about anything having to do with the sea in the Old Testament, um, the connotation is pretty much always negative. The sea, that's where, that's where the Leviathan is, right? That's where the monsters are. That's the place of the deep. That's the place of, of darkness. Um, they didn't she even... Old, she old? Yes. Yeah, so the place of the dead... By the time Greek mythology influenced pretty much worldwide culture, eventually, when Greek mythology did that, Hades, or Sheol was the, the Hebrew term, the place of the dead was seen as like an underground. And that's how we think of it today, right? When you think of hell, what do you think of? Like a big giant cavern down, way down there somewhere. And it's kind of dark and grayish and, and icky. And that's, that's the way they thought of the place of the dead. But the, the Hebrews, going back at least to the Torah, for them, you know, the place of the dead was the bottom of the ocean. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? So I don't know how I feel about this as a Navy man, but uh, there will be no oceans when in the new heavens and the, and the new earth. There will be water, but no, no oceans. And the holy city, Jerusalem. Um, so the city of Jerusalem comes here to represent what? <clears throat> That's the church. This is God's people coming down out of heaven from God. Here's, here's some of the language that helps you know that, right? Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So that analogy appears in other places in the scriptures, right? Where Christ is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. So what are you selling? What are you celebrating here when the bride walks down the aisle? What's the big deal? The wedding. Yeah. And followed by the, the wedding banquet, the feast, right? So is this a happy occasion or is this a soul <laughs> occasion? No, this is a yes, as joyous as, as can possibly be. Um, and a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people, God himself will be with them as their God. So I, I don't know how we make sense of all of this given our three-dimensional limitations. That we are, we are limited creatures and we're talking about things here that reflect um, the, the greatness of God which is more than what we can conceive or imagine. But when we think about where God is, you might think about God being in heaven. The Bible gives us that imagery. You might think about God being in the church, that he's kind of in the midst of us right here. That's, the Bible gives us that imagery. You can think about Christ being in your heart. The Bible gives us that. Um, but there, what it's describing here, even if we can't, line it up with all those other things and make it into a nice neat little formula that will make sense to everybody. Um, this seems to be a, a consummate, a, a final, um, a superior, ultimate um, Assembly? connection of God with his people. That he, he, we are right there with him. He is right there with us. And that's the, that's the joy, that's the gladness of heaven. Um, what do you want to do when you get to heaven? I used to think when I was a kid, I kind of liked, liked locomotives. My dad had electric train set. I always thought that was cool. And I thought, I'd like to have my own locomotive, God. Could I get one like gold plated? And wouldn't that be? And, and I had my, I remember one of my, one of my admirals was a great guy. And, uh, I got a chance to ride with him once in a car. You're, you know, usually you you're kept you you don't get too close to the admirals, right? <laughs> and I'm riding with him in the car, and we're talking. He's a great guy. He's, he says, "Yeah, I I think in heaven I I want to play golf. I love golf. I'm sure 
golf makes me happy, and I'm sure God wants me to be happy, so I'm going to play golf. <laughs> um, here's the thing. What are you going to do in heaven? What do, we, what do they do in the book of Revelation? Praise the Lord. Praise yeah, the Lord. They're, they're having church. Um, so I, I hope our church services are fun and exciting to you, but um, even at that, it gets tiresome after a while. You, you can only sit for so long. <laughs> you, you, after a while, I see... I, who was that? Oh, I don't see him here today, so I can pick on him. Um, <laughs> Floyd is back from Arizona, and he, he says, yeah, I left my hearing aid out in Kim's car. I said, don't worry about it. Nobody else is listening to me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can only hear so much, right? You can only do so much. But when we're in heaven, what it is is a giant magnificent worship service that goes on forever and ever and you'll never get tired of it I used to, when I talk to my confirmation class about heaven and what it's going to be like they don't want to go oh isn't that interesting they, their thought is it's going to be one eternal choir practice yeah <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so I, I you know what's heaven and, and they, we don't want to go because they, they're going to be bored because they won't have their you know, here's the marvelous thing. Um, let, me, let me talk about our, our emotional dimension as human beings. Um, because all human beings have emotions. Even the most stoic person you know, the person that you've never seen them cry, you've never seen them smile, the person that's, they have emotions. Everybody does. Um, there are individual differences so we vary from person to person and there are cultural differences so we Germans what do we think about our emotions keep them yeah keep them yeah don't 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 show that <laughs> keep that keep that going um, and and that carries over sometimes into our church there's a blessing to that because our culture shifts all the time and where is our culture right now when it comes to emotion Oh, they're gung-ho on the emotion mm -hmm. side, right? So you go to many, many churches, and, and I always have to caveat this. I'm not running down my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm not taking cheap shots at them. I, this is, I think, a legitimate cri critique that needs to be made. But many worship services are designed to s touch the emotions. And I've, I've been to that. I've seen it where the worship leader, I mean, if people are just kind of singing, they're like, okay, everybody put your hands together. Put your hands in the air. They're, they're trying to get you worked up, right? That's, that's the whole goal. And if you go to church and you go home and you haven't, like, had this experience, oh, um, then you, don't, you feel like you got cheated at church. And that's, that's the truth for the churches a lot of your kids are going to, um, uh, I have to say. Um, What's the drawback of that? Emotions are a good thing, but emotions should never be in the driver's seat, right? You never want to, you, you know, after your spouse dies, you don't want to sell your house, right? Everybody says, don't do anything for the first year, right? <laughs> because you, you make emotional decisions. When you go to the car lot, you don't go home with the car the same night. You go home and think about it, right? Because you'll make an emotional decision. I like that one. Um, Emotions should never be in the driver's seat. Emotions help us change the directions of our lives. So an emotional experience can move us and, and get us out of our doldrums. But you've got to have solid, healthy doctrine to stay on that road. That's what keeps you on the road. So that's why society is filled with all kinds of people who have gone to these emotion church services and, but now, after five years or ten years, they've drifted away. They're doing something, there's something else. It didn't sustain them. There was no depth. There has to be, there has to be depth. So as Lutherans, we've been really good on the depth. We're not so good on the emotions. <laughs> Somebody, if someone were to smile or clap in church, you know, I think the old Germans where I grew up, they, they'd look at them funny. <laughs> um, so so we want to we have an encouraged both. But if you, oh, there's a long way to say this, but if you've ever had one of those emotional experiences, um, you understand kind of what I'm getting at here in terms of how none of the trials and difficulties of this life can even compare. They just can't compare. 
I've had a bunch, but I'll share one with you that uh, popped into my mind. I was I was a chaplain on the aircraft carrier, and one of the guys that came to my Lutheran service told me his dad is involved in the. Um, now I forgot the uh, Protestant name for it, the Curcio program. Who knows what the Protestant name for that is? Right. I can't believe my, my brain's not remembering this. You mean um, charismatic? No. 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 What? The road to, a, like the walk to Emmaus is what the uh, oh. Methodists call it. They, there's different, it's the same thing, but different churches call it different things. So, um, you, you go to this thing, and you don't know what you're going to. You, they kind of tell you, oh, it's great, you're going to really like it. Well, what is it? And they don't tell you. <laughs> but when you get there, what it is, is you're broken up into groups, and you have a, a period of heavily concentrated um, devotion and study to the Lord. So they have different speakers come in, uh, and they're, they're not big professional speakers of people who have been through this thing before, right? And, and they, they, they talk about their walk with the Lord and you're encouraged and, and you find out later there are people praying for the whole 72 hours people have signed up there's someone praying every hour of the day and night um, and they provide all your you eat right there you sleep right there there's no going home there's no phones no computers no, it's just very focused and it has a very powerful effect because that concentrated looking into God's word opens the door for the Lord to do things. And so I can remember, I don't know if it was the second night or the third night, but um, I woke up in the middle of the night, like maybe two in the morning, something like that, I don't know. And everybody's sleeping, everyone's exhausted, they're all tired, so I kind of tiptoed outside and um, it was crisp, it was just, just like there was a frost, so maybe like right about 32 degrees. And I walked out there and I found like a, a wooden bench and I laid down on the bench and I just looked up at the stars and the sky was beautiful all clear and I was thinking about all the things I had heard the previous couple days and, and it was like it was just all washing over me all at once and I just started to weep and I started to pray and I was praying from deep deep down in my heart just the, like the like Jesus said you know the, it'll be like a of a well of water flowing up from within you. It's like I wasn't having to think about what words I was going to say. It was just flowing out. It was so powerful. And I, I probably was out there a couple hours. And the worst thing about it was I kind of realized I, I better go back. Or better. <laughs> and you, you don't want it to end. It's so beautiful. It's like the sweetness of being with the Lord that's so precious. You don't want it to ever end. And nothing else could get in the way. Nothing could interfere with it. That heaven will be like that. Only magnified a million times, and it will never end. Um, so uh, heaven is going to be a glorious and wondrous place. No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. What God has prepared for those who love him. All right, we got time for uh, one more verse. We are going really slow. Let's, let's look at Psalm 30. Psalm 30. Very famous verse, Psalm 30, verse 5. Would someone read that? For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night. But joy comes with the morning. Okay, what is the psalmist, what's David trying to tell us here? Look at that. His anger is for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. The, his whole point here, the point here, is that the bad thing, by contrast to the good thing, is like a little drop in the bucket. That's how we should think of it. So, what if... God forbid, may this never happen to any of you, but what if you had some kind of debilitating disease? I know a woman, she had that, uh, what do you call that, that fibrosis thing where all her nerves are always 
tingling and she was like in pain all the fibromyalgia yeah yeah that's it there, thank you yeah she had a bad case of it it was, it was a wife of one of my sailors and I, every time you saw her you felt for her because you could see on her face she's in agony every second of, of every day but contrast that if she lives that way her whole life by contrast to heaven that's just a moment it's just life is just a moment when it's all done with um, the eternity in heaven, by comparison, will so overshadow it, you won't even think about that. So that's to be our perspective. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. I don't know you, about you, the, I, I got two minutes here, I was, and I, we probably don't have time to go into any more verses, so I'll keep telling stories. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the worst night of my life in terms of like being of comfort and discomfort and that sort of thing. So when I was with the, I was assigned to the Marines and we were in Australia and we're doing uh, exercises with the Australian Armed Forces. So this was the plan, I don't know who came up with it, but we were all going to put on our full battle gear and we're going to load into these Amtraks. They're kind of like these large um, uh, they have uh, tracks like a tank, not wheels, mm -hmm. and they can go. They can. They're amphibious. They can go in the water, and they, they used to joke because they drive. They, they drive the things off the back of an amphibious ship, and they'd say, "When you go first, go in the water. It sinks down, and everybody's praying that it pops back <laughs> up." <laughs> so, and it's barely over the top. Uh, well, we were going to take ours over land and drive through the night and attack the Australians from behind at first light in the morning. So they load us up in these things. So imagine you've got on, you know, your uncomfortable boots, you've got on all your gear, everything is strapped on, you've got this flak jacket, you can't breathe in the thing, anyways, it's so constricting on you, you've got your helmet, so you're dripping sweat, but there's nowhere for the sweat to go, and, the, and, and, and they load us into these things, and I don't know if the capacity was like 20, I'm sure they put like 40 of us in there. We were packed in there, literally, you could not move. You were just jammed in like sardines so much. If your leg got sore or you had to scratch your knee or something like that, you couldn't. You were just, you were just like this. Everybody was like that. And then the thing starts going, and it's going overland through Australia. So it's going, boom, 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 bouncing around. <coughs> and then they, <coughs> they had a little hatch on the top, and they opened the hatch so that we could breathe. And well, guess where the exhaust is? Oh. Right inside that hatch. So there's like these diesel fumes oh. filling it, and everybody's so sick, like they want to vomit it. And at one point, we got stuck. So we, we tried going through something, we got stuck, and they said, Everybody just stay where you are, and we're all praying, Please let us get out for a minute. <laughs> They'll just stay where we are. And they came with another one and they attached a great big metal cable and they went to pull us out. Well, the cable snapped. It was we were that stuck. So you heard this boom as it hit the side. We all thought we were dead. But so by the time we got there, after doing this for eight hours, they said, Okay, everybody, everybody out, and the Australians are over there. When you hear the word, start running over there. And um, everybody was so beat up and sore and aching and sick and the Australians slaughtered us. They, <laughs> if that had been a real attack we'd have all been, we'd have all been dead. Um, but the weeping that tarries through the night, as bad as it is, you're just, you're just, just try sitting there for like an hour after hour after hour and all you're thinking about is when is this going to end? When is this going to end? That's what our lives are like, right? Sometimes we're in such suffering and pain we're just thinking, when is this going to end? But it does, it does end. And then the joy comes in the morning. With the morning light, the Lord brings us to his eternal kingdom, and that's where we'll be forever. Um, and all of this will seem like a dream. We'll hardly, you'll hardly even remember it. So that becomes part of our focus when we think about suffering in our lives. All right, thank you all. Sorry we went so slowly, but I'm really glad that you were there. <laughs>